Hello everyone, this is Tae Kwon from Keen, New Hampshire, and this is your Ripe Global Weekly Case Review. And today I would like to share a case of Claudia. She presented to my office for evaluation of number 30. She was having a lot of pain around this area. And when you, when you look at radiograph, you can clearly see that there is a periapical lesion on number 30 distal root. And also there is a large post on the distal root. And there is a broken file on the mesial root. And although number 31 also has possible periapical lesion, which was under endodontist care, number 30 deemed to have questionable to hopeless periodontal prognosis. Thus, we decide to extract number 30 and plan for socket grafting and implant placement in the future. On the buccal aspect, if you remember the photo from before, you can actually see there's some recession on the buccal aspect, most likely suggesting that there's some buccal dehiscence on the crestal aspect. And to preserve the volume of the bone, we decide to perform socket grafting at the time of extraction. Extraction was done in a very atraumatic manner. Uh, we sectioned the mesial and distal root, and this is how the socket looked like. You can clearly see, as we anticipated, there was crestal buccal dehiscence, about three, four millimeter. And you can clearly see the, the level of the crestal bone at the mid buccal aspect is much lower than the proximal aspect. Now, a lot of time, one way to do bone graft is to take the tooth out and then put some bone graft in without elevating the flaps and then put a membrane and tuck it under the flap and then suture it. That's one way to do it. And I'm sure that it works as predictable um, as what a lot of people expect. But sometimes I like to close these sockets completely so that the membrane and bone graft do not get disturbed or contaminated during the healing. Because from certain literature, it is found that whenever the membrane get exposed, you actually get less quality bone or less volume of the bone. But there are also literature suggesting when you actually do the flapless technique and then let the membrane expose, you'll get the same bone. So this is one of the area that you can approach in both way, but I just wanna show you this case where I, how I approach this to get the primary closer. So the bone graft has been placed. In this case, I used the freeze-dried uh, bone allograft, which were hydrated with platelet-derived growth factor to maximize the regenerative potential. And I put a cross-linked collagen membrane, which is uh, more rigid in general, and also is less prone to degradation when it gets exposed. And after that, I release the buccal and lingual flap with the uh, elevator without any vertical incision. I just go in with my buzzer elevator or periosteum elevator and I stretch the tissue from the buccal and stretch the tissue on the lingual. And this is all blunt dissection. And what I want to emphasize here is I actually release the lingual aspect. And then when you're doing that, obviously you want to do it very bluntly because there are some important structures on the lingual aspect. And then what you're trying to do is actually you're purposely tearing the attachment of mylohyoid muscle. And then when you do that, you will actually notice that your lingual flap will be so much more released to the point where you can achieve primary closure tension free. Once I snuck it in this membrane, I will actually put the series of the suture in layers, one being horizontal matrix suture, starting from the buccal aspect, go over the membrane, and then come out through the lingual, and then come back from lingual to buccal, and tie the knot on the buccal. Then when you do that, the flap is going to be coronally advanced. And then after that, I use continuous sutures on the crest uh, with a little bit of twisted interlock, so that I can bring the flaps together. And then sometimes, if necessary, I may actually augment this crestal aspect with single interrupted sutures. 
So this is how it looks. In this case, I did not need single interrupted sutures at the end. Pretty much I was able to get the primary closer by putting a horizontal matrix suture from the buccal aspect and then crestal continuous interlock suture using 4O Vicro. And you can clearly see that primary closer has been achieved and the site can now heal without any disturbance uh, worrying about opening up the flap. And even though, let's say, it opens up from the tension, it will take much less time to close compared to when you leave this membrane exposed from the beginning on purpose. I don't always do this way, uh, but in certain cases where I think getting the primary closer is more important, especially when buccal bone is missing or there's some large infection, I like to close the socket like that. One may argue that well, when you actually advance the flap to get the primary closer, you're going to alter the mucogingival junction and you may lose keratinized tissue. I think that's a good argument, but sometimes in my hand, as a periodontist, soft tissue surgery is much more predictable than bone graft surgery. So I rather want to mess up the soft tissue to get better bone because I know how to correct the soft tissue later completely. So one way to solve this is when you're doing the incision, when I'm doing the implant, I can always make the incision lingualized and then push this mucogingival junction back to where it should be. And if that's not enough, I can always augment this area with free gingival graft or any other gingival graft technique. So uh, I hope you learn how I do everyday basic socket grafting when I decide to get the primary closer. And this is how I do it. And if you want to learn a little bit more about how I suture, how I manage the flap, when do I want to get the primary closer, when do I want to leave this membrane exposed and then let the tissue heal. If you want to learn this, feel free to join me at Ripe Global for fellowship in implantology. Otherwise, I'll see you for your next case.